Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. In today's video, we're gonna be continuing on with the two sample mean procedures that we introduced in the previous video, taking a look at a couple of examples of running these new procedures. If you recall from the sort of previous video, we introduced two new types of situations, namely two sample mean situations where you have two separate samples of quantitative data, and you either wanna run a hypothesis test or build a confidence interval based off those two separate or independent samples and then a matched pairs uh, analysis, which is used when you have two samples of data that actually happen to be from matched pairs from a matched pairs study. So we're going to take a look at a couple examples of running those hypothesis tests and building those confidence intervals. As we do these examples, not only are we going to get a chance to sort of run through and see how those computations work, but you guys will also get a chance to sort of learn a little bit more about how to correctly identify the appropriate procedure based on the information that's sort of given to you. So let's jump right in and take a look at this example. So for this first example, we're going to suppose you're interested in studying if the average time spent using mobile internet, by mobile internet we just mean internet on like smartphones and tablets, etc., is different for Chinese adults compared to U.S. adults. To study this, you randomly sample 101 Chinese adults and 61 U.S. adults and record how long they spend using mobile internet for a single day. You find out that the Chinese adults spend an average of 198 minutes with a standard deviation of 85 minutes, while the U.S. adults spend an average of 143 minutes with a standard deviation of 101 minutes. So what we're going to do in this sort of example here is we're going to carry out a hypothesis test at alpha equals 0.05. Again, that's just our significance level there to test the claim that the average amount of time spent using mobile internet for Chinese adults is different than the average amount of time spent using mobile internet for U.S. adults. Then, after that, we're going to build a 95% confidence interval for the average difference between the amount of time spent on mobile internet for Chinese adults compared to U.S. adults. And then finally, we're going to look at the type 1 and type 2 errors in this situation. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So for A, right, we have to say we're going to be doing our hypothesis test here. But now, unlike when we were originally doing this, this is a little bit more challenging because we have three different hypothesis tests. And it could be any one of the three, right? We have the one sample mean, the two sample mean, and the match pairs. So let's take a look at, based on this information, which of these is it, are we going to be working with? So if you look at this, right, the first thing you want us to sort of diagnose is how many samples do you have? Well, if we look back here, we randomly sampled 101 Chinese adults and 61 U.S. adults. That means we have two samples. So this is either going to be a two sample mean or it's going to be matched pairs. Were these people matched up in any way? Well, there's no information that says they were matched and it wouldn't even make sense to match them because we had 101 Chinese adults and only 61 U.S. adults. So there's no way we would be able to match them. So what this tells us is that we're going to be doing a two sample mean hypothesis test. Maybe it doesn't really matter right now because all the hypothesis tests we've learned about are about means, but how do we know this stuff is quantitative? Well, you can see that the information we have here has terms like average and standard deviation, average and standard deviation. Again, those are only terms that make sense when you're talking about quantitative data, so it's got to be a two-sample mean hypothesis test. All right, so let's go ahead then and jump into the actual five steps of this. So let's talk about the hypotheses first. So for the hypotheses, right, we know we need to set up our null and our alternate. Well, if you have your notes in front of you from how to run a two-sample mean hypothesis test, you'll know that the null hypothesis is always the same thing in this situation. It's always that the two population averages should be the same. When we wrote this out in the previous video, we wrote it as mu1 equals mu2, and we could do that here, but of course, we actually have two different populations here. We have Chinese adults and U.S. adults, so we might as well use some appropriate subscripts. So we could say mu sub c for the average for Chinese adults would be equal to mu sub us for the average for U.S. adults. So in other words, without any extra information or any extra data or anything, our baseline assumption is that the average for Chinese adults would equal the average for U.S. adults. Now let's think about our alternate hypothesis. So our alternate hypothesis is going to have those same averages, but it's going to introduce some inequality sign. So remember, the alternate hypothesis matches our claim. And our claim here is that the average time spent for Chinese adults is different 
than the average amount of time spent for U.S. adults. So the key word here is different. Different doesn't necessarily imply greater than or less than. It just implies literally different. So that means that we're going to be using a not equals to there. And that's going to make this a two-sided test. It's a two-sided test because we have a not equals to, and the real tip-off to that not equals to was the fact that it said different in the claim. Okay, let's go in and take a look at the conditions here. So for the conditions, remember that the conditions for a two-sample mean hypothesis test is basically just the conditions for the one sample mean, but repeated twice, once for each sample. So we need both samples to be random and representative. So let's just go back and check. Well, we can notice that it mentions right in here that we randomly sample 101, US, 101 Chinese adults and 61 U.S. adults. So we know that those are both stated. So we can just say that that's stated in there. All right, second thing we need to talk about is whether or not the uh, both sample sizes need to be less than 5% of their population sizes. Okay, so again, every time you go to do condition two, you're always gonna know the sample sizes, but knowing the population sizes mm, could, be, could be true, might not be. In this case, we know that the sample size for Chinese adults was 101, for US adults it was 61. We can look through the text here and there's no mention of the total amount of Chinese adults or the total amount of US adults, but we know that certainly both of those populations are very large. So all we would need to say here is that there are lots of Chinese adults, check, and lots of US adults, check. So that's satisfied. Now, this does bring up one sort of interesting thing here, right? If you go back to the hypotheses, you might be wondering, did it really matter that we put uh, mu sub c, or the average for the Chinese population, first, and the average for the US population second? Would it have been the same had we put this guy over here and this guy over here? And the answer to that is actually, yeah, it's actually totally the same. You can write the hypotheses in any order. But once you've written these hypotheses, Everything else from step two onwards has got to use the order that you defined in the hypotheses. So you'll notice that right here, I wrote lots of Chinese adults first, not just out of coincidence, but because I specified that population as the first population. Every time now we talk about the first population or first sample, we'll be talking about that as the Chinese group, whereas every time we talk about the second population or the second sample, that'll always reference the U.S. group. So you can do it in any order up here, but then once you've chosen that order, it's got to be consistent the rest of the way. All right, for condition three... Condition three says we either need to know that the data sets are approximately normal. Unfortunately, we don't have any raw data here, so we're not going to be able to do any stem and leaf plots. But luckily, we do know that both samples were relatively large. Specifically, they're both size 30 or greater. So we can say N1 would be 101, which is greater than 30. Check. How do I know N1 is 101? Again, because I put the Chinese group first, so that means N1 has to be 101. And N2 would be 61, which is also greater than or equal to 30, so check. So all the conditions are met. You'll notice that all the conditions here are just repeating the standard conditions twice, once for each sample. Okay, now let's go ahead and move on to our test statistic. For our test statistic, we need to have T equals X1 bar minus X2 bar over the square root s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. To plug in to this equation, you basically need to know six things. You need to know x1 bar, s1, n1, x2 bar, s2, and n2. So some of these things we've already mentioned, n1 and n2 we've already stated. So n1 was 101 and n2 was 61. Now we need to go grab those averages and standard deviations. Keep in mind again, for group one, because of the way I set up my hypotheses, this all has to correspond to the Chinese group, and this all has to correspond to the US group. So let's go ahead and grab those values. So average and standard deviation in our Chinese sample, if we look back up here, look to be an average of 198 and standard deviation of 85. So we can record those, 198 and 85. For the U.S. sample, it looked to be an average of 143 and a standard deviation of 101. So we have 143 and 101. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug all that stuff in, and then we'll go ahead and calculate that. So we would get T is 198 
minus uh, 143 divided by the square root of 85 squared divided by 101 plus uh, looks like 101 squared divided by 61. Now, one comment that you should just note here is that in the denominator here, you are only squaring the standard deviation. So this is 85 squared, then divided by 101, and 101 squared, then divided by 61. You're not squaring the division there. There aren't parentheses. So what's the easiest way to actually compute this on a calculator? Well, as always, just do the top and bottom separately. You can actually type the entire bottom in at once. So on top should be pretty easy. Uh, looks like you should get 55 up top. And in the denominator, if you go ahead and you type it in, you get square root 85 squared divided by 101 plus uh, 101 squared divided by 61. And it looks like in the denominator there, we should get about 15.45. Okay, then go ahead and actually perform your division. So what you need to do there is take your 55 and divide by 15.45, and looks like we should get 3.56. Okay, so we've got our test statistic. We're now ready to go ahead and get our p-value. So to go get that p-value, we need to use table C. We need to get the degrees of freedom. Well, remember degrees of freedom is generally the sample size minus one. Well, we have two different sample sizes, so remember that the trick here is that we just choose the minimum. So we would do the minimum of 101 and 61 minus 1. In this case, the degrees of freedom, the minimum of 101 and 61 is 61 minus 1 gives us 60 degrees of freedom. So we have 60 degrees of freedom, and we have a t value of 3.56. Let's go see where that puts ourselves on our table. Remember also, we will be using the two-sided p-value here. Why are we using the two-sided p-value? Again, that's because from our alternate hypothesis, we use that not equals to. So let's go and take a look. We've got a t of 3.56. So if we go ahead and locate that, we've got 60 degrees of freedom, so right here, and our t was 3.56. So 60 degrees of freedom, 3.56, looks like that puts us right over here. So we'd be at 3. 0.56, mm -hmm. 60 degrees of freedom. So we find ourselves a little bit off of the chart on the right-hand side. Uh, if we follow that down, right, that would put our p-value right here. Remember that the p-values get smaller as they go this way. So we now know that our p-value is smaller than the smallest two-sided p-value, which is 0 0.001. So we just figured out that our p-value here is less than 0 0.001. So it is smaller than 0.1%. Let's go ahead and make our conclusion then. For our conclusion, we take this p-value and we compare it against the alpha of 0.05. Uh, where do we get the alpha of 0 0.05 from? Well, of course, that's just stated right here in the problem. It says alpha equals 0 0.05. So how does the p-value in this case compare to that alpha of 0.05? It is certainly much, much smaller, right? Because we know our p-value is smaller than 0 0.001, so it is certainly less than 0 0.05. That means we would reject the null hypothesis. In other words, you can think about this as successfully rejecting the null hypothesis, which means we do have significant evidence. What do we have significant evidence for? Well, evidence is always in terms of our claim, and our claim was that the average was different. So we have significant evidence that, on average, the time spent on mobile internet is different for Chinese adults compared to US adults. So in other words, we are actually convinced that these two populations, Chinese adults and U.S. adults, have a different average in terms of time spent on mobile internet. And the reason for that is we basically, through this computation right here, figured out that our sample averages of 198 versus 143 were far enough apart to say that that's not just happening from via coincidence. That's actually detecting some overall population difference. Okay, so this right here was your guys' first example of running through and doing a two-sample mean hypothesis test.
Now, as a follow-up to this, since we found that there is evidence for a difference, the next natural question is, how large is that difference? So let's go ahead and move on to part B and build a 95% confidence interval for that average difference, now that we know that there is one. All right, so for part B, we want to, we'll zoom in a little bit more there. For part B, we want to do a 95% confidence interval for average difference between Chinese and US adults. So notice that we're estimating for the average difference. So this is also going to be a two sample mean confidence interval. If you go back to when we introduced this two sample mean confidence interval, we said the two sample mean confidence interval is used to estimate the average difference. Remember, one sample mean confidence intervals would be a used to estimate, say, the average for Chinese adults or the average for US adults. But when you want to measure the average difference, that's going to be a two sample mean confidence interval. So let's jump in with the conditions. Well, one thing we talked about in the previous video is that the conditions for this confidence interval are the same as the conditions for the hypothesis test. So we've already checked them. So we can say already checked. All right, so we can move straight in to the construction. So for the construction, we got to have our formula here for the two sample mean. It's x1 bar minus x2 bar. That's what we use as the point estimate. Plus or minus t star square root s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. So we're going to need seven different things here. We're going to need x1 bar, s1, n1. We're going to need x2 bar, s2, and n2. And we're going to need t star. Now, these six things here, they all just have to deal with our data. So we can go back and just use the exact same values that we had over here. So these guys here, they're going to, we're just going to carry those over. So it looks like this guy should be 198. Uh, it looks like this guy should be 85 and 101. This guy should be 143. Uh, the standard deviation for the US group was 101. And the sample size was 61. OK. Now we need to go ahead and find T star. Remember, T star is going to come from table C. We're going to take our confidence level, which is 95%, and we're going to intersect it with our degrees of freedom. Well, we're still doing a two-sample procedure, so we're still using the smaller of the two, which would be that 61 and subtracting 1. So it would be the minimum of 101 and 61 minus 1, which is 60. So let's put those two together. So if we do that over here, 95% uh, percent is right up here. And if we follow that down to... Well, we can zoom out a little bit, so hopefully we can see it. 95% and 60 degrees of freedom. Looks like we should be right there at 2. So this guy, 2.000. All right, that would be our value there. Okay, so that's our T star. Let's go ahead and record that. So T star is 2.000. All right, let's pop all those things in there. We got 198 minus 143 plus or minus 2.000 square root, uh, 85 squared over 101, plus S2, which is 101 squared over 61. Okay, plug all this in. As always, you can do the margin of error as one computation. This time, we also do need to do this part separately, so we just need to do that subtraction there. Looks like that subtraction should come out as 55, plus or minus. This you can type directly into your calculator, so just do 2.000 then times square root 85 squared divided by 101 plus 101 squared divided by 61. Go ahead and compute that. And it looks like you should get there about oh, 30.9. Then go ahead and build your interval by doing the subtraction first. So 55 minus 30.9 looks like you should get 24.1. And then on the addition side, you should get 85.9. You can write your interpretation by saying that we are 95% confident that the average difference uh, for time spent using mobile internet is 
between Chinese U.S. adults is between 24.1 and 85.9 minutes. So this is a very formal uh, interpretation of that confidence interval, basically saying that we're 95% confident that the average difference for time spent using mobile internet between these two populations is between these two values. This is totally fine if you want to interpret it this way, but I am going to just write a little alternate interpretation over here. Considering that the way we did this was that we took the Chinese average and then we subtracted the U.S. average, right, and all of these are positive, that's basically saying that the Chinese group had a larger average, which, of course, we can see there, 198 versus 143. So you can interpret this as the average difference, or you could interpret this as how much more time, on average, Chinese adults spend compared to U.S. adults. So let's go ahead and write that. We could say that we're 95% confident that on average, Chinese adults spend between 24.1 to 85.9 more minutes per day using mobile internet than U.S. adults. So this would be another sort of phrasing of this, right? It's to say that we're 95% confident that on average Chinese adults spend between 24.1 to 85.9 more minutes per day using mobile internet than U.S. adults. We could also flip it around and say that we're 95% confident that on average U.S. adults spend between 24.1 to 85.9 less minutes per day using mobile internet than Chinese adults, right? So there's some alternate sort of interpretations here because we're measuring the difference. All right, last thing that we sort of want to do here for part C is we wanted to talk about the type 1 and type 2 uh, errors. So to do that, let's remember what our hypotheses were. HO was that the average for the Chinese group was the same as the average for the U.S. population. And the alternate was that the two averages were simply different. So let's go ahead and talk about what the type 1 would be. Remember, in general, type 1 is that you reject HO but HO is true. So let's think about what that would be in this case. Rejecting HO means that we would be throwing this out and saying that the two populations are different. So let's write that out. This would be where we decide there is a difference in average time spent using mobile internet for U.S. adults compared, oh, uh, we should say Chinese adults first because that's our first population there, for Chinese adults compared to U.S. adults, but in reality, well, HO is true, meaning that the averages are actually the same. But in reality, the averages are the same. So once again, type 1 errors are generally viewed as false positives. This is where we think that there's some difference between the average time spent using mobile internet for our Chinese population versus our US population. But in reality, the averages are just the same. And I realize I should have changed that, but in reality, just so you guys can sort of see that a little bit more clearly. But in reality, the averages are the same. Okay. Just so that when you guys look over that, you can see that the stuff written in blue here is the reject HO part, and the stuff written in red here is the HO being true part. Okay, let's go ahead and do the same thing for type 2. Type 2 is where our decision is to fail to reject HO. But in reality, the thing that actually is true is that HO is false. So this means, in this case, we are unable to throw this out, but in reality, it is really wrong. So in this one, we would say we decide there is no difference. And then just to spare ourselves, we'll say in average time spent using mobile internet for 
Chinese adults compared to US adults are all the way down to here, so just the same stuff as all that. But in reality, what does it mean for HO to be false? Well, that means that this guy is actually wrong and they are different. But in reality, the averages are different. So in this case, uh, we often call a type two error a missed effect, and that's exactly what would happen here. This is where we would say, oh, there doesn't really seem to be a difference in the average time spent using mobile internet for Chinese adults compared to US adults. It basically seems like the two populations are the same, but the averages really are different and we missed it. So there we go. Now you guys have seen your sort of first example of running through and using the two sample mean procedure there. In our next video, we'll go ahead and we'll see an example of the other procedure we talked about, the matched pairs analysis.